uh, I was I got involved in the uh, divestment campaign in South Africa, and we had rallies uh, and protest marches every day for months. The one the one notable thing I did have I had probably the loudest voice of anybody who could who was yelling the slogans. I had a really really loud voice. You could, people could hear me from a long way. I knew I was there, uh, and so I was. Uh, contacted uh, about uh, about a takeover sit-in of Nassau Hall, and I agreed to do that. This happened. This started. Oh, I think I was first contacted sometime maybe in March, and so it went on. And I had no. no this was this was done in a very quiet fashion. I did not know who. Any of the other people who were involved were, except maybe a couple others who I talked to, who for just just knowing them from there, and it happened after soon after my my God thesis was done. I had, I, I turned in a 240 page thesis on the relationship between Hong Kong and the People's Republic of China during the period of time that we that the United States was uh, organizing a uh, a boycott of China, and that. I spent a lot of time on that, and it was long. And finally, when I got over with, uh, something like a couple of days later, you got the knock on the door and said it was time to go. We we're going to go and occupy Nassau Hall. Uh, get your stuff. And so we went and we spent the night. Uh, I don't remember where it was, but we spent the night. Uh, I think it was off campus uh, until the middle of the night or in the early morning. And it was sneak on campus and come through here and go through these. Somebody had it all planned out. This was, I didn't have, didn't wasn't involved in any of the planning of this, but it was really well planned. And so we sort of snuck around this backside here, and then we we hid out in an empty classroom. And then when they had the doors open, it was rush on in in the middle of the night and unoccupied. And there were over 200 of us, uh, as it turned out. I had no idea how many people were going to do this. And I think we stayed in Nassau Hall for two days. Uh, 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 demanding that the trustees divest uh, from the certain stocks, stocks of certain companies who were doing business in South Africa. I don't know that the trustees did it then, but it happened. Short, it happened within it happened within a year thereafter. They actually did do it, and it turns out the stuff that that was one of the few times that a uh, a divestment slash boycott the campaign ever was successful. And the only reasons it was successful, I figured out later on, was that it doesn't work against places like Cuba or China, where they really don't want to have anything to do with you anyway. But the white South Africans, they wanted to be part of the first world, and they, so they, they really were, the boycott bothered them. The boycott, because they wanted to be in. It's not like the Chinese or the North, North Koreans or the Cubans who wanted, who wanted nothing to do with us and were just happy to be boycotted. And that's why I think it ultimately worked and helped crack the regime. My father came up uh, unannounced uh, the weekend after my thesis was there and I found out they couldn't see me because I was in Nassau. I was, I was, we were sitting and taking over Nassau Hall and uh, his remarks was, he doesn't want to graduate. <laughs> but uh, in the end, uh, you know, we, it, was, it, was a very, it was a very Princetonian type occupation. Uh, nothing got trashed or anything. We even cleaned up after ourselves when we left. I was glad to see that there were a lot of people because like, there's safety in numbers like, when you do when you're doing something like that. I came to Princeton as an alumni daughter. When coeducation was first announced, I was in high school, and uh, uh, well before application time, and. Uh, my father, who had been class of 39, Buzz Bedford, was dead set against coeducation until it became possible for his daughter to apply. So I sent in my card. Uh, Tim Osander might have been director at that time and got a very polite reply. I said, um, you know, your interest is duly noted. Thank you for your interest. We'll send you the materials at the right time, and, uh, which was a few years later, obviously. Uh, this was an era where social stratification was changing over dramatically in the United States. So it was the, we had, I'm sure we had debutantes in our class, and we had other people who wouldn't have been caught dead at 
a, a debutante ball, right? People who wanted to hitchhike across the country and, and go hang out in Haight-Ashbury and San Francisco or something like that. As a member of the class of 78, we were all still so, we the women, were still all so happy to be here that it didn't seem different. And for all the difficulties that we might have had as women on campus, we just put up with it. Um, I, I think the um, the flap in 1976 over Nancy Weiss's tenure in the history department was kind of the first clue for me that women were really having a hard time in Princeton. For, for me, somehow it hadn't come up in the in my courses, but uh, the fact that um, Professor Challoner, the uh, history department chair or a colleague was willing to uh, resign, leave Princeton, over the fact that Professor Weiss had not been granted tenure originally at that time, um, uh, was a real revelatory experience. And uh, eventually, uh, actually quite quickly, the, um, the decision was reversed. And she stayed. And of course, Dean Malkiel had a long, successful history as, as dean of the college. So it was a great great addition to the Princeton faculty. Well, well worth granting tenure, too. Um, it wasn't until much later as I continued my activities with alumni affairs that uh, things really got on the roll in terms of changing, uh, Princeton changing itself from a place where women were welcome to a place where women belonged. Like when we changed the words to Old Nassau, I was part of the Alumni Council Executive committee um, when that decision was made and then celebrating the 25th anniversary of women at Princeton and so on and so forth. So things have gotten better. You know, it, it, there's a difference between being invited in as a guest and feeling like it's your home. And I think there are very few women who could argue now that Princeton doesn't feel like a home place for them to all these years later. I came from um, Kansas City, Missouri. And I was the first in my family to consider going to a place like Princeton. I, th I think just dealing with East Coast kids was sort of intimidating in the beginning until I figured it out. But, you know, kids who were from New York and you know, Eastern suburbs and all that sort of preppy stuff um, was totally new to me. Also, I'd gone to a girls' school. Um, my last two years of high school had been in a, in a girls' private school. So I think the co-ed bit was kind of hard to adjust to, even though I'd been in co-ed schools before that. Just because when I, when you know, class of '78, we were girls were in the minority, so it was a little bit overwhelming um, to be a minor, all of a sudden a minority. Um, that was a little hard to adjust to. And I remember there just seemed to be this hostility towards the women on the part of the boys or guys or men um, because. They'd say, "Oh, you're using the ratio," or you know, you're, everyone seemed to assume that because there were so few girls that we were all being rushed by suave seniors, you know, wearing orange wide wheel cords, and that wasn't the way I felt at all. But I felt like that was projected on us from a social point of view. So um, yeah, I thought that was kind of strange. I do remember my senior year. Well, in my day at the Scribner Room, there was. There was one room in the sort of three-part area of the Scribner Room where you could smoke. And so the sort of dark-haired, you know, heavy-bearded or sort of heavy, what do you say, stubbled, intellectual kind of new, I, I mean, I thought of the sort of New York intellectual crowd would go into that third room and smoke and study probably 20th century or contemporary fiction and then the likes of me who were studying sort of Renaissance literature and poetry would sit in the middle room and we didn't smoke and we you know, wore bright colored outfits. And I remember at the very end of school, someone had a picnic and one of the most sort of Rabelaisian of the New York, we, were all, we all went to the same picnic and this sort of Rabelaisian fellow, smoker, heavy smoker said, we had this great conversation about music because I've actually always loved punk rock and secretly had this whole punk music collection, but no one had ever known that um, at Princeton. <laughs> and he said, oh, isn't it too bad that, that we never, that we, the smokers room never talked to the people in the non-smoker room, and we never had any 
intellectual, you know, discussions, you know, that there was just this kind of wall. And again, I just think that was somehow, somehow something that happened at Princeton. People did engage in this kind of stereotyping, um, which I guess college kids do. When we arrived, um, I think the ratio was five to one, at least that's what I've been saying all these years. Someone last night said, no, it was three to one when no, I first five. got here, and I said, no, it was five. You were sort of looking around for other freshman girls, and, you know, but the other thing is that the other, the five, the other five were also looking around for the freshman girls, and so were all the, all the other men in the classes above, because there were just only so many of us, and so... So we found each other. So we found each other, and we're like, yes! <laughs> It's another girl from same home state, you know, we can talk. And I, I think it was a sort of a bonding thing. And, and we found other girls, too, that way. Yeah. And so it was it, some very strong friendships. Three weeks into um, our tenure at Princeton, having found each other in the freshman orientation week, um, Cottage Club gave a party and had a slew of women just freshman women trouncing in. And what we found out after the fact was that um, the guys at Cottage had grabbed the Freshman Herald, which I believe still exists. The original Facebook. Which is now probably all online. Mm -hmm. And they had apparently gone through and circled the freshman girls they thought were cute and invited them to how did, a party. How did, how did they... How did they invite us? I don't remember this. We had a big engraved invitation. Or, I don't know. Who knows? We used but to get mail in those days, you know, under, under the door. We used to have notes under the door. That's probably what it yeah. was. It was probably an invitation yeah. under the door. I think it was an invitation under the door. Which is a sign of the times and this five to one mm -hmm. ratio mm -hmm. phenomenon because I always told people that if I didn't have five dates a weekend, I wasn't holding the average. See, I didn't even know what she, she was had. What she, I had no, <laughs> no idea what she was talking about. <sighs> you know, there was a certain amount of. Um, glass ceiling breaking that we did, um, but I also... The bathrooms. <laughs> <laughs> the bathrooms, we walking in and just seeing rows of urinals. Yes, and, and we you had know. to, all the women had to, most of us had to walk like three or four flights down to down. get to the one woman's bathroom. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, at any rate, but I, th I think all of that sort of straightened out and paled, and, and if you weren't willing to sort of, you know, deal with it, um, you know, you weren't going to be happy here. Right. And so, you know, you just don't, those were just sort of logistical things that you overcame. And, you know, maybe they made some good choices in, in choosing us and, and our other friends because we could just kind of... Unflappable. They're, uh, unflappable <laughs> and positive. And there was so much to take advantage of here that why wouldn't you just blast right through it, you know, and just sort of, you know, make the most of it. And, but what I was thinking also in terms of legacy um, was that what Princeton gave, um, one of the many, many things that I think it gave to me without me really even knowing it then, um, was the idea that I could do anything. Um, and here I was in this environment, you know, after a couple of years I started a magazine here yeah. with a friend. And, uh, and pretty soon there were like 45 people working on it on campus and they gave us an on office on Nassau Street and, you know, we just, we had a ball with that thing, and that was like our extracurricular activity, and we made it up out of nothing. The, I think it's also a sign of the times, especially for women of our generation, that this was still a time where, for right or wrong, we were led to believe that we could do it all, mm -hmm. and that is be the perfect professional, the perfect wife, and the perfect mother. Mm -hmm. I think we also subsequently suffered some disillusion on that point, mm -hmm. but it was incredibly empowering generational um, you know, beliefs and, and Princeton was phenomenal and, and, and power because you know, we, we got a lot of attention and the nature of the institution you know, being undergraduate focused and the ability to have relationships with faculty and do a million things. Mm -hmm. I, I completely agree and the epitome for me, you're going to laugh because I haven't told you this. Ooh, this is, a, I told my children they don't believe it. When I graduated <laughs> from Princeton, you're, you're, this is the theme of being empowered. I'm not joking. My goal was to be the first woman president of the United States. Was it really? <laughs> Coming out of Princeton, that was my goal. I had no uh, idea. Seriously. You didn't tell me that. <laughs> well, that just shows how naive and stupid I was at the time. But, but that really speaks to, you know, your, 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 how this right. institution right. just never put a lid on it. So I came down for the weekend. And I stayed with the only other girl from my high school who'd ever gotten in, who'd ever gone to Princeton, uh, Lori Bennett, class ahead of me, in Wilson College. And I came and I sat 
in this Wilson common room. And there was this trio, black African-American kids, a guy named Dave McCormick playing piano, and a guy, I think his name was Coots, I forget, a, a, a tenor and a girl singing. And they were playing Roberta Flack and Donny Hathaway songs and the spinners and singing and I thought, wow, Princeton really is cool, you know, it's a really hip place. Well, why don't I give it a shot, you know? So I decided to go here. And I came here and I was absolutely miserable here. <laughs> I really, it wasn't what I saw in that common room at Wilson College, you know. It was, there was so, it was so much preppier, so much preppier than my experience had been growing up in Harvard Square. And um, the sort of stratification of the certain eating clubs and the nerds and the Jewish kids and the waspy kids. I mean, it's sort of the balkanization of social groups really kind of um, unnerved me. So I went back to Harvard and I said, um, can I transfer? And they said, well, you can transfer, but you have to live at home. And I, I didn't want to do that. So then my dad got really sick. And it was sort of a perfect opportunity to leave Princeton. So after my sophomore year, I left. And I went back to Cambridge. And I lived at home. And I helped my family uh, try to put their life back together. I, I waitressed. And I started taking uh, piano lessons and music theory lessons with a woman at Harvard who was a fantastic music pedagogue, who gave me a ton of skills that I really needed. And then I came back to Princeton. And it was almost like I came back to a different school. I made all these new friends. Um, I was in cap and gown, sort of titularly, but I started hanging out with uh, a much more artsy crowd. And one of my new friends from the RA orientation said, you know, I want to start this cafe underneath Murray Dodge. You know, and I want you to be the first performer. And I said, well, okay, you know. And I had some Bonnie Raitt songs that I sang, a couple of other songs. I played the guitar and I played the piano. And one night I went and I played some music there. You know, I looked up and the place was full. It was like jocks from cap and gown and my, you know, New York intellectual Jewish crowd. And I mean, everybody was there. It was the place was just like standing room only. Like, oh wow, I can, you know, I can do this. This is kind of cool. And um, I had no idea I could do that until that happened. And afterwards, I became a musician. And I think. Um, I didn't really believe in myself as a musician, but I, I managed to um, sort of get in with a group of young people who, who did see something that I had that I didn't know I had yet. And so when I got out of school, I was able to kind of, at first, kind of timidly pursue it and then, and then dig in. Princeton, there was something uh, very magical, uh, particularly about the campus. It is a magical campus. Mm -hmm. I, I did fairly well in school, but when I got here and I was, I don't know, whatever the average, like 17, 18 years old, and I'm walking around the campus and I'm seeing that the kids in my class, some of them are 14 or 15, and suddenly I, I said to myself, uh-oh, I'm, uh, apparently I'm here with a bunch of little geniuses, uh, which, and that sentiment only increased the more I <laughs> stayed here. So um, it was very frightening. Uh, it was also a very, very preppy campus. I can, I, the town still is, obviously. I'm assuming a good part of the current, um, you know, student body is still sort of preppy but but not as much but for me the difference coming from a very sort of loosey-goosey public high school into this very traditional uh, background to me that was frightening I had to adjust to that when I was here creative writing was 
a brand new department. It was the only really, a, apart from maybe Triangle and Theater on Tube, the only truly creative thing that anybody could do, and it was sort of frowned upon. You were, uh, you weren't truly intelligent or academic if you, uh, you know, went into the any type of a creative course. And I see now, I mean, that's really changed, and which is phenomenal. I love music. I was involved in a lot of the uh, the singing, and the singing groups. Um, to me, that's a great memory. Is just hearing sort of bits and pieces of music floating from different archways and different buildings or going down to the, um, I've forgotten the name of the music building, and then and hearing all the different instruments, you know, practicing in the different practice rooms. I have a sort of a bad habit of uh, always trying to pick the most difficult route for myself. So I said, well, English would be, if I went into the English department, it would be way too easy. I'm not going to do that. Let me do the equivalent of literature, but let me put it in another language. So I did that. Um, I ended up, actually, my um, thesis advisor was uh, Suzanne Nash. And I had had her in my freshman year and bombed. I mean, I think I got like the first C of my life, and I was devastated, and I, oh, God. And by the time I got around to being a senior, I. I don't know what got into me. I decided I'm picking her because it, it, word had it that she actually was uh, easier on the, the boys than the girls. And so I figured that's a challenge. So I'm doing that. <laughs> so I did. And I ended up actually doing very well. I got a thesis prize. So that worked out fine. I had from sixth grade on, I had had this idea that I wanted to become a lawyer and get involved in international affairs and then ultimately become the first female Secretary of State and save the world. This was my great goal. And so my primary interest in Princeton was uh, not the fact that my father and my grandfather had gone there, but because the Woodrow Wilson School was here. I was really happy to have all those goals, and as things evolved, um, I changed my life plan completely. Um, because I spent a summer working in a law firm, and I spent another summer working for a congressman on Capitol Hill, so that I could get see what my fields were going to be like. and. I did not like either one of them. I didn't like the politicking. I didn't like strategizing. I learned that law does not equal justice. And so all of my youthful idealism was shattered, and uh, which was a really good experience. And I went, OK, I am at square one again. What am I going to do? And because I like thinking and thinking about everything, I just thought, all right, I'll, just, I'll major in philosophy which was a fabulous uh, undergraduate major. Um, it was very, very challenging and wonderful. I'm sure you've heard this before. Uh, women were still pretty much a novelty uh, when we came. I think there had been only six graduating classes before us. I, I'm sure nowadays students would not understand what that felt like. But we were still, we were children of the 50s. So our parents had come from this very traditional social structure. You know, men only work, and women are housewives. And um, I remember one of the more, a very interesting conversation I had one year with one of my roommates. and. We talked about what it would have been like if we had been the oldest sons in our family instead of the daughters. And that was a fascinating mental exercise because both my granddad and my dad, uh, my granddad was very wonderful and gentlemanly and traditional and he played football and he was a member of Ivy Club, my dad did crew, he was a member of Ivy Club and I thought, man, if I had come to Princeton, I probably would have felt like, as a guy, I would have probably felt like, oh, I better bicker at Ivy, you know, because otherwise I won't, be as, I won't be respected by my family. And what was so fabulous about being a woman here 
was that I was free from all of that, the weight of social expectation. I mean, hun you know, hundreds of years of male experience at Princeton, and I could make my own experience here as a female, and it didn't matter. And I loved feeling unlimited. I could take, I could major in anything I wanted. I joined Terrace Club, um, and I had a wonderful time. I knew wonderful people, interesting people, and I didn't have to deal with social or familial expectations, and being female freed me from that at the time. I had grown up in New Jersey, was born in New York, grew up in New Jersey, and moved to Houston beginning my sophomore year of high school. So I was from the Northeast originally. Okay. And um, but I fell, right away I fell in love with the campus. And the campus was the thing that really stuck out. And then of course obviously with all the great opportunities that Princeton offered, I consider myself very fortunate obviously to get in. You really could find any group of people you want to. I think what I loved about Princeton was the diversity. Um, and I'm just not only racial and obviously um, in ethnicity, but I, I think there was great diversity in minds and thoughts. And I think it opened your mind up to other, other views. I think that's the nice part about Princeton, is that people are fairly friendly, that you're able to really you know, find people with similar interests or similar ideas or different ideas. And I, I think I can't tell you how many times we set up a night arguing about politics or arguing about, you can imagine anything from whether sports to politics to, you know, we were in suites in Wilson College our first two years. So that was, you know, we had big common living room and one first year was seven man suites, second year was a six man suite. So there was always a lot of activity. I, it, I debated between chemical engineering, chemistry, and biology. So pretty, pretty similar you know, stuff. And, and, but I enjoyed my courses, I enjoyed my professors. It's funny, some of my best professors were probably outside the biology department. Um, that's what the wonderful thing about Princeton is all the opportunity and the strengths in all the departments. And, and I think here I didn't know exactly what I was going to do. I didn't think I was going to be a doctor when I first came here. I ended up becoming a doctor. I, I, I think Princeton offers a flexibility by having so many strong departments that if you change your mind, because after all you're only 17 or 18 when you come to Princeton, that you have that opportunity to really grow and really do almost anything. Mm -hmm. I guess if I had to do over again, I'd go to Princeton again. I mean, you didn't ask that question. I think that's the key question. And, and my bet is if you poll Princeton students or Princeton alumni and compare them to all the other institutions in the country, I bet you if not one of the highest, we might even have the highest rate of people who would return to Princeton that I've met alumni of many different schools and they have great experiences, but I think there's a loyalty to Princeton that doesn't exist in, in, in other places. Um, Freddie Fox who was here for years, I think, was really the spirit of Princeton and really did a great job of, of sort of um, investing in the students starting in the freshman year and by the time you left you really had this loyalty to Princeton. Maybe we were brainwashed, I don't know, maybe it was in the water. But it really, I find in my, in my path that I really don't see this from other schools. Uh, the Daily Princetonian was my major outside, outside, well, organized activity. And then, as I mentioned to you, I played a lot of ping pong. I, I'm on campus September 1974, and I guess I first got involved in more in the second, the second, I started getting involved in the second half of the semester. In any case, it, it was very influenced by Watergate, by, you know, you know, by the events you know, that had just occurred. And, and um, you know, the, the, the editors had, you know, there was a very, you know, certainly, certainly a strong belief in a very aggressive form of, form of journalism. Um, I remember Michael Zelenziger, who was the chairman of the Princetonian for the class of 77, the year ahead of mine, um, or he, his sort of unofficial theme was kick ass. I think the Princetonian uh, yeah, loved you know, stuff that felt like the real world happening here, you know, um, and certainly protest. If you got 
you know, if you got five people to chant, the Daily Princetonian was, was going to treat that as news. And certainly the, the divestiture uh, campaign here was treated as, as big news. And they mobilized a lot of people. I mean, I, I knew a little bit um, the guy who was sort of the, the central figure in that, um, Lawrence Ham, who then, who then changed his name, or to, to some extent, I'm not sure if he changed it legally because I've seen him later, as Adimu Changa. Um, who was really, and he was really, I think, kind of in training to be a revolutionary. I think that was really what, or, and I don't, I don't necessarily mean that. I don't, I don't know that that. I don't mean that necessarily in the sense of taking arms and overthrowing. But I think that was his, that was his outlook and his mindset. And I happened to have taken uh, an elective, I guess, the second half of freshman year, argumentation and conference speaking. And he, he wanted to know about. He wanted to do that too. My thesis, the subject of my thesis, was. <clears throat> the New York State Liberal Party. I remember I interviewed a very memorable day in my life. I interviewed Henry Stern, who was a um, he was a member of the Liberal Party. He was a I was I knew who he was already. He was a a city councilman from Manhattan who had gotten elected as a councilman at large on the Liberal Party line. And really, what happened was we went. I spent quite a few hours with him as, we, as he went through the paces of his day and as he could would talk to me for five minutes here, 15 minutes there, take another phone call, you know, turn back, talk to me, what were we talking about? And I was very annoyed by it at the time, but afterward I realized what an amazing day it had been. I, I may remember that day better than any day in my life. The number of different discrete, it, uh, here I was, I was, I was 21 now, I was very interested in politics, you know, had followed it a lot, you know, in the newspaper, you know, in, through in the news, whether the newspapers or the you know or the TV news, um, through um, had, been, had been involved already, you know, to you know, to to a limited extent, obviously, and but this was the first time I'd ever spent a day with a working politician. And at the end of the day, I remember the last Henry sort of escorted me out to the elevator outside his office and said, um, and he knew I was graduating. He said, I'm you know I. Imagine I'll be, I don't know if he said hearing from you, hearing, I think he said hearing about you. But in fact, a few months later, I was working for another, another New York City Council member on that same floor and attending meetings in his office. And so uh, as, as that happened. And then later, I worked for him at the New York City Parks Department in the 90s. I wanted to go to Princeton. My father wanted me to go to Wellesley because being an alum, he'd seen how Princeton was towards women. And he said, too much partying, too much this. <laughs> I wanted to go to a sheltered school, but I chose Princeton instead. My father is a very religious man, and he's very um, protective and very, as we should say, really a straight arrow. So he used to complain to his mother about beer cans in the, in the gutters at Princeton. And um, so I kind of took it with a grain of salt, knowing the way that he was. Well, I studied a lot. I mean, I am a self-professed nerd. I mean, I really loved my academics, and it was so much better than high school that it really got me going intellectually. So that was one really great thing. Um, and that, that did take up a lot of my time. I kind of had an epiphany that what I really liked was art history, so I switched, I switched majors about four weeks in and majored in art history. And I, that, I would never have anticipated that because um, I was much more of a math and science person in, in high school. You know, I really didn't have a great liberal arts background from high school. I mean, uh, our English classes and things like that in high school were very limited, so I, all of a sudden this like new world opened to me of, and this was a visual world, so I think that that really worked for me. I was really into symbolism in painting. I love that stuff. And um, I love Northern Renaissance painting. I remember... Um, I remember working on my thesis, and it was one of the only times in my life where I could sit at my carol in the art history library and just have four, hour, have four hours fly by it. I didn't even notice because I was so engrossed in what I was doing, and that um, I, that's very memorable to me. Socially, aside from kind of the party scene, coming from the Midwest, I, I found Princeton to be very stratified. And um, I mean, I'm sure this is not an uncommon comment, but you know, there was definitely like um, a group of people from prep schools and stuff that kind of seemed to stay to themselves. And also, there was a tremendous black-white divide. Uh, 
it at the, on the campus at that time. And there was like a women's center, but it was all very marginalized at that point. And I certainly um, was not very into that type of thing when I was here, thinking that women, I mean, I really thought when I was at Princeton that I would eventually just kind of become a, a mother and housewife, you know? I mean, I, I was from a very traditional background, so none of this stuff registered a lot with me. Um, I don't know why. When I look back on it, it's like, <laughs> what was I thinking? <laughs> But, you know, as I get older, and even before I got older, you know, just my most of my adult post-Princeton life, I guess I've come to appreciate um, Princeton, my Princeton education, uh, more and more. I mean, I, I feel like I am so lucky, and really one of the main highlights of my life was, was being able to go to school here. Um, I was born and raised in the town of Princeton, and I went to Princeton High School. Um, I was very involved in music with private teachers, and I sang in the high school choir, and um, wasn't getting a rigorous enough musical education at the high school. So I graduated as a junior, and then designed an independent program for myself in lieu of my senior year. And one of the things that I did was, my, one of my private teachers was friends with some of the faculty members in the music department here at the university and um, talked to her professor friends and they uh, allowed me to audit some composition, a composition in a theory class. I uh, really enjoyed the classes, but I, I wasn't expecting to go to college necessarily. I wanted to, I was thinking, do I want to go to a conservatory? Do I want to go to a liberal arts college and major in music? Do I want to just start working professionally as a gigging musician? Um, taking the classes here really opened up my eyes about the notion of what a really rigorous academic program could be in a class of something like 1,200. I think there were like, you know, 200 valedictorians of their high school class and the average SAT scores were like in the 99th percentile. I'm thinking, maybe they made a little bit of a mistake in letting me in here and I was really, really intimidated um, setting foot on campus as an admitted student because I was thinking, these people are amazing, you know. If they, if my classmates weren't football captains, they were valedictorians, or you know the the star soprano in you know their their school musical, and and I was a composer, you know. So, uh, but you know you find your way, and I and I think to a certain extent because I was so petrified of the the that atmosphere. I worked extra hard freshman year. Uh, I got involved in a lot of activities, mostly centered around music, but not totally. Um, and and those activities were a huge part of the the education that I got. Um, I wrote for Triangle, sang in the Nassoons, sang in Freshman Singers, and and um, occasionally uh, did some things with the Glee Club. Or being involved in the student groups in some ways, and the informal musical stuff had more of a direct impact on my career. For example, when I was in the Nassoons, I was doing a lot of arranging of songs. And so I've continued that ever since. The Nassoons, although they're the oldest singing group, uh, student-led singing group on campus, founded in 1941, um, when we were in school, the class of 41, that's basically our dads. It's that age. And we would have, um, on the Friday night of every reunions, that was one of the peak experiences of the year, was the current student group singing for the alumni. And talk about your, your, your harshest critics as well as your most beloved audience. Um, they knew every note of every song that was in the, the repertoire that you inherited. Many of them had been the arrangers of those numbers, you know, so they had a personal stake in it. And we, they had entrusted this thing to us Hello, youth. You had a deep sense of the connection of sort of that endless line going back, um, and how you were just a, the keepers of the flame for the four years, and then you were going to hand it over to, to the ones who succeeded you, um, probably more than any other experience that I had at Princeton. So the idea to design an atomic bomb uh, came, it was actually my junior paper. The premise at the time that was widely accepted was that um, you didn't really need to worry too much about the spread of uh, nuclear uh, 
uh, reprocessing technology because it would take a Manhattan Project to design an atomic bomb. And of course that was exactly wrong, as conventional wisdom often is. It turned out that if an undergraduate at Princeton uh, with mediocre grades could design an atomic bomb, uh, or, or at least roughly sketch it out, uh, then there were many students with better academic scores in Pakistan or India or um, elsewhere um, <clears throat> uh, who would be able to do a much better job of it. It was a deep dive into, uh, in, into the, the science of uh, weapons uh, design. When I turned in the paper, I didn't know how far I'd gotten or what the grade was going to be. When I went back to pick up the paper, I was told by the departmental secretary that it had been classified uh, and I couldn't have the paper back. And I was kind of shocked by that, of course, and, and the fact was it had been locked up. And, but I got an A plus on the paper. It didn't occur to me or to Dyson or anyone to tell anybody about this. It was, a, it was an academic exercise. The publicity around this came from a classmate of mine who was a stringer. Um, it was a stringer for some local, for some newspapers. The interesting part about the experience to a lot of people was was that an you know, undergraduate had designed, had designed this thing, but, but rather the, the, the one that I think policymakers uh, reacted to and had the biggest impact was the fact that afterwards, when I returned for my, uh, my what was then my, to be my senior year, um, after the summer, um, I was approached by representatives of two foreign governments who wanted to buy the design. And that's when the the real publicity started, and the New York Times wrote a story. You know, the headline was something to the effect that nations beat path to door of Princeton student for bomb design, a bomb design. And boy, was there was there ever a lot of publicity. There were reporters following me around, and TV crews out in front of you know my club on uh, Prospect Street. The university arranged for me to get a, an agent and a, um, an entertainment lawyer, uh, and uh, it was. It, I had, a, I had an opportunity to interact with uh, not just the producer, but the, the agent, the, you know, the entertainment lawyer, and others in the industry. It was fascinating. It was really interesting how these things work. But there was a book. The decision was made to write a book uh, from which the movie rights would be sold and adapted. And so David and I uh, uh, collaborated on the book, and um, uh, the book was, was published. The movie rights to the book were sold. Uh, and uh, for a brief while, it looked like I was going to be playing myself in the movie. Uh, it's it's an experience that that other people uh, sort of go through. You know, it's sort of instant fame, and then it sort of goes away. But people remember. Uh, you know, or, or weren't you the guy, or aren't you the guy? So you know, it's been, it's it's going to be uh, tattooed on me for the rest of my life, and and uh, I mean that in a good way. My father had been a Princeton uh, graduate, as had my grandfather, um, and so we certainly, as, as a kid, we used to come down here for reunions, and um, so I, I enjoyed that. Um, and when I got in, I couldn't turn it down. <laughs> so, And what I didn't realize at the time was how much of a bond that would turn out to be with my father. My primary thing was hockey. Um, when I was in high school, my senior year, they started a team, and I didn't think it was going to go, and besides, the practice was five in the morning, and so I didn't sign up, and it turns out that it did go, and they had a great time, and I really regretted that. So um, in early September, early October, freshman year, um, Liz English came up to me and said, we're starting a hockey team, or, you know, are you interested? And I said, sign me up. The hockey um, coach or whatever um, recently sent something out asking for pictures from over the years from hockey. And I looked at the first freshman year picture, and there we were in our sweatpants and sweatshirts and cockeyed helmets of all different kinds and everything else. And that was the, the fall of the freshman year. And by senior year, we actually had real jerseys, which as it turns out are these really heavy, heavy, um, whatever the men were wearing five years earlier, <laughs> and we, we got their hand-me-downs again, but I still have my jersey. If you could skate, you were on the first line. Um, so I managed to keep my first line spot the whole time, 
if you didn't know how to skate, we taught you how to skate, and um, you know people kind of learned very quickly and moved up the ranks, and and you know also became good. Um, but it was it was amusing. So that you know, for most of the time that I was playing, we had two solid lines, and then two lines that were a little scary. Um, so that was one thing. But but so did all the other teams, and and we were actually a pretty good team, you know, relative to the Ivies and relative to the tournaments we went to. One of the tournaments that we played up at Brown, um, where we uh, you know we had like three games in 24 hours, and there was this female reporter. She walks into the locker room and, you know, because she could, because we were women. Normally, she wasn't able to go into the men's locker rooms. And she saw us changing and was shocked to realize that we were wearing garter belts. And she said, does that mean that men wear garter belts? And we said, oh, yeah. <laughs> so she asked if she could take a picture of it. And uh, that picture wound up uh, me with my co-captain. I was. Um, not, I did not have my pants on, um, and uh, you know we had beer or champagne or whatever up in the air, and it became a full-page color photo in Hockey Magazine, um, and uh, it, it caused a bit of stir among some hockey parents, although most just were really happy that we were doing this and having such a good time. Um, but it was it was fun. It was like you know our our moment of fame to get this whole article written about the team and. Uh, and what women's hockey was doing. Princeton had gone co-ed not very long before I arrived. And even though the numbers were, the ratio was three to one male to female, it felt like about 12 to one. Um, I remember searching crowds for other women. I, re I really felt very, very outnumbered. I also felt that it was very geared towards students who had gone to prep schools and who, and um, was not, and it, I just felt out of place having gone to a public high school, even though, as I said, my public high school was very high achieving, was a, a tremendous place. I had a great education, but I felt like there was a certain exclusivity about um, a mindset, especially among professors, of um, when we'd first meet, going around the room and asking folks where they prepped. So in some respects, I really felt like I didn't belong. I was an extremely active performer, musician performer on campus. Um, as a freshman, I was in Cats and Jammers. I was in the chapel choir. Um, I started doing solo recitals my second, my sophomore year. Uh, I was, uh, I got involved in a musical theater activity in, in the community. Uh, one summer, the summer between my sophomore and junior years, I stayed on campus and had a job in Nassau Hall, but I used that time to prepare for another recital I was giving. And so during that time when I was on campus, I used to sing weddings at, uh, in the chapel. Um, that, so all of those activities brought me into contact with other students of all classes who were doing music, uh, with community members who were professional or semi-professional musicians. So it did definitely give me a, a sense of community, um, a, a sense of, of, of place on campus. This is not a happy story. This is not a good story. Um, <clears throat> and I've struggled with... Um, with saying this out loud, um, but I think it's a story that needs to be told. Um, there is one professor who served as a mentor to me, a professional mentor to me, um, who gave me tremendous, uh, he was somebody in the music department who gave me tremendous opportunities, um, and uh, sadly, he also sexually assaulted me. And that was a pivotal experience in my life, and it completely derailed my singing career because I suddenly lost trust in someone who was a professional mentor, and I felt completely lost and betrayed, and I just didn't know how to go on in, in, my, music, in my musical pursuits 
when he was still there on campus and I was still there on campus. And um, I had been elected to be the president of the chapel choir. And I was very excited about that partly because I really loved the chapel choir. I had been in it since I was a freshman, and it was a group I had done a lot of work with, and and I was very honored to be elected president of it. But it also meant that I would have been the first woman president of the Princeton University Chapel Choir. And I thought that was really cool. Um, and after the assault happened, I dropped out of chapel choir because I didn't want to be around this person. I couldn't be around this person. And... Uh, I suddenly began to wonder, well, why did he give me so many performing opportunities? And maybe I wasn't as good a performer as I thought I was or as he had told me I was. And so I dropped out of Cats and Jammers. And I switched voice teachers, thinking maybe going to somebody else would be helpful. And I started studying with someone who lived in Philadelphia. So then I would I would travel off of campus regularly to, to go to my new voice teacher. So the, um, the musical tethers that I had to people and experiences on campus were definitely severed. But I did have a good circle of friends, so I had lots of reasons to feel like I still had a, had a role and a place at Princeton. Um, but that event um, really, uh, really transformed my, my identity as, as a Princeton student. You know, now you go to any, even high school or college campus, and there are posters in every restroom about places, people you can seek out and places you can call if something like that has happened to you. Um, and that didn't happen in 1977. It took me off of a career path that maybe I should have stayed on. I did still try to sing for a while, and I entered a graduate program in Philadelphia for opera singing, um, and that didn't go very well. And I ended up dropping out of that music program, but ended up working at the college where I was going to school, um, and uh, ended up having a, a pretty successful administrative career there for a number of years, but during that time, I then began asking myself, well, you know, remember back when you were in high school and you started college and you were thinking about pre-vet or pre-med? Well, what about that? Um, and I wasn't sure that that was really what I wanted to do, but I was sure that I didn't want to wake up 10 or 15 or 20 years down the road and kick myself for not trying so I enrolled in the post-baccalaureate pre-med program at the University of Pennsylvania, and I took those horrible pre-med courses uh, at night and on weekends for three years while I was working full-time. And I matriculated at Dartmouth Medical School in 1987 at the age of 31. And I uh, hated the first two years of medical school, but I still felt like I didn't have enough information to make a decision about whether or not I wanted to stick with it. And I stuck with it, and I'm very glad I did. Um, since then, I've, I terminated my clinical career so I could devote um, my efforts to research and education in ethics. I learned qualitative research methods and ethnography and interviewing techniques because I was very interested in the language of medicine. And that brings me full circle back to singing which is all about interpretation and language and text. And, um, and, and so I, I feel like I can draw from my experiences uh, as a musician performer and what I've learned in terms of qualitative research methods to apply to, um, to ethical issues that arise in healthcare. I really appreciate the opportunity to tell my story. I, I appreciate that very much. I know that um, in, in looking through the, the interviews from uh, Class of 62 on, on the website, that um, those stories are not very much like mine. And uh, I don't imagine you're going to get a lot of stories very much like mine. But, but I really, uh, I wrestled with whether or not I should offer to participate in this. And I felt that... Um, Things like that happen. They happen everywhere. 
and they are part of the reality of a place. And so it was a story that I felt deserved to be told, and so I appreciate the opportunity.